Hey everyone, welcome back. So back to a nice backyard morning. Um, today I want to do something very different. We're going to be talking about Bayesian statistics, yes, but we're going to be approaching it from a lot more philosophical lens. You might have noticed, or you probably have not noticed, but I tend to stay away from the whole philosophical side of math and stats on this channel, trying to keep it as practical and grounded in reality as possible. But every once in a while, it is really fun, and I think in this case actually very helpful to think about the philosophical differences between Bayesian stats and the more traditional frequentist statistics. Now you might have heard these two terms thrown around a lot in the stats or math community, Bayesian versus frequentist statistics. And if you haven't really studied them, you may feel like there's this huge war going on in stats where one side is trying to gain control of all of statistics, but that's not exactly how it is. Yes, there are differences. Yes, there are people who are on both sides of the extreme. But the reality, as with anything, is that people fall on some area of the spectrum. Nobody is really fully one or the other. But there are differences, and in this video, philosophical differences that we should talk about. Now, because I've never done this kind of philosophical type video before, I did a lot of research, looked a lot of resources and videos online about this topic. And it seems like everybody kind of has uh, related but somewhat different opinions on what the philosophical difference is between Bayesian and frequentist stats. And I guess that's somewhat expected because it's not truly a math debate. It's not like right answer versus wrong answer. There's a lot of nuance even within uh, one of these fields, Bayesian or frequentist, there's people who are arguing about what's the right interpretation, things like that. So let me give you my two cents. And of course, there's lots of resources you can uh, look at online as well if you want other people's opinions. My two cents, my opinion on the debate, is the way in which we interpret the word probability. Now, you've probably gone through most of your life, most of your academic career, having some notion of what probability is and assuming that everybody else around you have more or less shares that notion of probability. But if we really want to understand the philosophical difference between Bayesian statistics and frequentist statistics in their purest forms, I think we need to understand what probability is defined as, what it means to both of these fields. In frequentist stats, a probability is a property of a sequence of events happening over and over and over again. And specifically, as we do that sequence of events over and over and over again, we measure the frequency of times within that sequence where we observe a particular outcome. Now that's the really high level overview, but the easiest example of course is a coin flip. If you hand me a coin, I don't know if it's a fair coin or not, and you ask me to figure out what's the probability it comes out heads, if I were a frequentist, I would immediately just start flipping this coin as many times as possible, and then count the number of times it came up heads divided by the total number of trials I did, and that's the best answer I can give you for the probability that this coin is going to come up heads. Fair enough, makes total sense. What other definition of probability could there really be? Now we enter the very strange and beautiful territory of Bayesian stats, where probability is not only defined as the results you get from a series of events, but also based on your prior personal subjective belief about what the probability should be. At first, this seems wrong. It definitely felt wrong for me. Math and stats are all about right answers, correct answers, we should all arrive at the same conclusion. Why would we design a whole field of stats where it is grounded in this idea that your answer can be different than mine and that's okay? To go back to the coin flip example, if I'm handed a coin and I don't know if it's fair, and now I'm a Bayesian and you ask me what's the probability that this coin comes up heads, I could have an answer for you before doing any coin flips at all. To a frequentist, that sounds absurd, because remember, for a frequentist, a probability is a property of a sequence of events, and not having observed a single event, there's no notion, there's no point talking about probabilities yet. But to a Bayesian, I could say, well, in my experience, coins are usually fair, therefore, I think this coin has a 50% chance of coming up heads. And that's my answer. And somebody else who's also a Bayesian might say, in my experience, coins have been only 25% likely to come up heads, Therefore, I'm going to assign a 25% probability to that coin coming up heads, and we're both correct, and that's fine. Now, another property of Bayesian stats is for both of us, if we were to start flipping the coin many, many, many times, we should update our beliefs. And this is kind of the central phrase to Bayesian stats, update your beliefs, which means that whether I thought it was a 50% chance of coming up heads or somebody else thought it was a 25% chance of coming up heads, as we observe real data coming into the world, we should shift our beliefs towards that real data and in the extreme, when we've observed many, many, many samples approaching infinity, our 
probability of what the coin should come up heads should be basically grounded in the data. Our belief should kind of get washed away at that point. So Bayesian stats is more of a thinking philosophy where we say that we can assign a probability to anything, even though without observing a single data point. But as we observe some real data in the real world, we should start shifting our beliefs towards that real data. Now, frequentists would say that you shouldn't have prior beliefs in the first place because there is some right answer about what the probability is. It's just that I don't know the right answer yet, so let me just start collecting data immediately in order to figure out what that right answer is. So hopefully you're starting to see these distinctions, but if not, I have a couple more examples for you because I think it helps to just think about this in various settings and see which one has pros, which ones has cons. Now you may not be convinced, and I would, and I would agree with you here, where looking at the coin flip example alone, Bayesian stats seems reasonable in any way. I mean, a coin flip is something you can literally do over and over and over again. You take an afternoon and you flip this coin and you'll pretty much figure out the answer. And Bayesian stats really shines when we start thinking about things that are difficult to get many samples for, or maybe there are no samples, things we can't easily repeat. And this is the part in the video where we start moving towards all these parallel worlds, and I should have had my tinfoil hat next to me in case I need to put it on if I start sounding too crazy, but let's start a little bit simpler than that. Uh, let's just say that you have two people moving to a new city. And so this new city was just founded yesterday. There's no real statistics about the city. It's just a cool place that people want to move to. Now let's say one person moving to this new city is called Sally. Now let's say in the original city that Sally was living in, the probability that you would get robbed was 1%. Very, very low. You're probably not gonna get robbed. Now let's say another person moving to this city is called Harry. Let's say in the city that Harry is coming from, the probability of getting robbed is much higher at 25%. So without even thinking about stats, put yourself in the shoes of these two people. If you're Sally, you're probably assuming that places you're gonna live are gonna be safer. There's no real reason to put extra locks on your doors or anything crazy like that. If you're Harry, places you're gonna live are pretty dangerous. You might wanna invest in several extra locks, uh, security systems, stuff like that. So now let's say they both move to this new city of Baysville. Let's just say that's the name of the city I just thought of right now. And they each get an apartment and we observe what they do. Sally just leaves her door unlocked. There's no danger, right? Harry buys 10 extra locks for his door, buys a security system and installs them all in the apartment because from his perspective, the probability that I'm gonna get robbed is much higher. Now, if you're a frequentist, you can't really explain this. There's not a framework for explaining this from the way you view statistics because you would say in this new city, even though I don't know what the crime rate is going to be, the probability of getting robbed, there is some right answer. And so since that right answer should be shared by both these people, it's difficult for me to explain the differences in their actions. Why is one person buying all these extra locks and one person being so casual about the security? If you're Bayesian, this is the perfect situation to use your way of reasoning, because you would say that actually probabilities are subjective. Sally's coming into this town with a low probability of thinking that she'll get robbed. Harry is moving to this town with a very high probability of thinking he'll get robbed, and therefore their decisions and behavior line up completely with that reality. Now, as the city moves into the future and we start collecting actual stats about how likely people are to get robbed, we should hope to see Sally and Harry both adjust their likelihoods of getting robbed, their probability of getting robbed, to words or in line with that data. And now the frequentist perspective makes more sense because we say a year into the future, when we know the crime rate is actually, let's say, 10%, we know that's the answer with some degree of certainty, and we should see Harry and Sally's beliefs shift towards that, and their behaviors may shift as well. But this is, again, at the core of the philosophical difference between frequentist and Bayesian reasoning. On that first day in the city, frequentist stats really doesn't have an answer for you, has nothing to say. Bayesian stats has a lot to say and is more in line with human behavior and reasoning, which I suspect is why it was invented or used in the first place, because it's more in line with the way we actually think about novel situations. As humans, we're always bringing in our prior experiences in life. We're not just starting every day fresh as newborn babies or anything like that. We're bringing in our own subjective and diverse perspectives on the probabilities of various events happening and using that to inform decisions, but then also changing those if the data says otherwise. And now let's round out the video. I'm gonna put on my imaginary tinfoil hat now and talk about not just low sample size situations. We know that when you have low sample sizes, Bayesian stats can sort of come to the rescue because it's going to say that even without observing any data, I can have some kind of prior belief on a parameter and I can update that if data were to come in. Let's talk about one rather extreme case where you're dealing with a problem where you have a sample size of one and that sample size basically by definition cannot go up. What kind of problem in the universe could this be? 
Well, actually, the answer was in that last sentence. It's the universe itself. If you think about our universe, we only have one of them. Uh, maybe there's some kind of multiverse out there where there's alternate dimensions. We haven't found them yet. Uh, maybe we will someday, but for all intents and purposes, right now there's only one universe. And any property that we've observed that is basically common to our universe has also a sample size of one. For example, take the speed of light. The speed of light is 299 million something uh, meters per second, right? We've only observed one speed of light because it's a common constant to our entire universe. And so now let me ask you a kind of absurd question, which is, what's the probability that the speed of light for a universe is between, let's say, 200 million and 400 million meters per second? A frequentist would stand up and leave at this point. There is zero point to talking about this question. Because again, from a frequentist perspective, a probability is a property of a frequency of events happening over and over and over again. And like I said, by definition, we're not going to have another universe pop up anytime soon, so we're dealing with a sample size of one. No sense talking about frequencies with a sample size of one. Bayesian steps in and says, I got you covered, right? A Bayesian can say, well, I know that in our universe, this is the speed of light. So let me just form some kind of distribution where that's the center, taking into account the fact that the most common one should be the one I've observed in this universe. But I can form maybe like a normal distribution around that quantity. Somebody else can come in and say, actually, I think that normal distribution you drew is a little too wide. Let me make it narrower. Somebody else can come in and say, I think a normal distribution is the wrong answer. Let's have some kind of long tail distribution to the right. And in a Bayesian setting, all of these people are correct in the sense that they're coming in with their own subjective prior beliefs about the speed of light in some possible reality. And yes, you can say this is absurd because what's the point of if every answer is correct? But the way I like to think about this is that we're not really doing this analysis because we're looking for the right answer. I mean, like, of course, probably none of these people are correct. Probably there's some correct distribution out there that's not really too close to these. But the point of Bayesian stats is that it gives us a framework in which to talk about alternate realities at all. Because from, if we were all frequentists and we refused to go even a little bit in the Bayesian direction, we couldn't even talk about alternate realities because we couldn't imagine the constants that would govern those alternate realities. It just doesn't make sense to talk about. If we're Bayesians, we can start sort of mathematically talking about alternate realities because we can say, all right, let's pretend that normal distribution you drew is the distribution for speed of light in our alternate realities. Now I want to simulate an alternate reality let me draw from that distribution. Okay, this is the speed of light. I can use that quantity to run my simulation. I can say based on that speed of light that I just sampled, uh, the size of the universe would be this big and the time it would take for information to get from planet to planet. Guys, I, I don't know any physics. I don't know what I'm talking about here, but you can get the idea. The point is that with Bayesian stats, you have a framework to start talking about things that have uh, low sample sizes or even sample sizes of one or actually even sample sizes of zero, right? Uh, this goes back to the example with Harry and Sally moving to the city. They have no samples of crime yet, yet they're able to have some kind of prior beliefs of these probabilities. So like I said, this video is a little different than usual. Not really grounded in applicability too much, but I think it does help to understand the fundamental differences, the philosophical differences between a frequentist and Bayesian perspective. So let me know if you like this video. I'm very curious. Um, I suspect some people may find it kind of crazy and others may like it, but Either way, I'd love to hear your comments. So thanks for watching, like and subscribe, and see you next time.